these are the topics which we are covering today is the three signs of being, the five skandhas, and three fires. So before we look at today's talk, you will see that the teaching is set out as list, as, a, uh, as various lists. Um, so when, when we look at uh, Buddhist uh, doctrine, uh, we, we come across many teachings formulated as lists. So we have, for example, three signs of being, uh, three fires, four noble truths, uh, four foundations of mindfulness, there's five skandhas, there are six senses, seven factors of enlightenment, and it goes on like that. Um, there, there's 37 factors of enlightenment as well. So there are various things to be said about these lists. In the early days, Buddhism was not written down. It was transmitted orally. It was put in a written form several centuries after Buddha. So one can speculate that the method of laying down the teaching in, in lists is to enable memorizing and therefore transmission of the doctrine. Now, you know, it may seem mind boggling at first to see these numerous lists. It's, 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 it might seem endless. You know, we might say to ourselves, surely, you know, I can't learn all these, uh, all these different lists. Uh, however, one does not need to get insight into each and every list to start with. All of these lists are pointing to the same truth. And the truth they are pointing to is sometimes formulated in one way, sometimes the other way. And by getting insight into one teaching, uh, it will open up insight into another teaching. So therefore they reinforce and they build on each other. And so during our practice, you know, sometimes one teaching might open up and at another time, another teaching might open up, but they all lead to the same place. Um, Another preliminary worth mentioning is that these formulae that, that are laid down in lists are actually practice formulae. You know, they are for practice actually. Uh, yeah, and yes, we do need a theoretical framework and that is why the formulae are set out. Uh, uh, and that is indeed why the Buddhist Society does this course uh, to give a theoretical framework. Uh, however, we can say with certainty that no one will get, gain liberation or uh, enlightenment by theoretical study alone. It is necessary to see what these teachings point to in our everyday life, and insights only arise when we recognize incidents from our life that actually relate to a particular teaching and suddenly we realize, ah, this is exactly what that teaching was saying. So we can gain access to Buddha's awakening through practice with doctrine as a framework, never by just simply studying the doctrine. And, and we had a, um, something, uh, something from Buddha's life last week where this was pointed to where, you know, the Buddha was being trained to be a world ruler. And so he would have known about old age, sickness and death, yet he was sheltered from that. And when uh, Buddha actually went out uh, in the town, away from his protection in the palace, and when he first saw an old man, a sick man, uh, and, uh, and a corpse, it, it had a 
it, it really had an impact on, on him. So, you know, th this again shows that, you know, we may study something and, you know, we'll say yes, and uh, yes, it makes sense, et cetera, et cetera. It's really when we see examples from our daily life uh, that the teachings really open up. And the aim of the practice of Buddhism uh, is to open up one's own inner world. You know, what we are, what motivates us, what pleasure we look for, what frightens us, what we run away from. It is to look at all these things and look and look and look and see where they are in accordance with reality and where they are not. And ultimately, it is to go beyond this inner world of ours so that it accords with the true nature of all that there is. So right, now with that, we can actually look at the first topic. Uh, and the first topic is the three signs of being. Now, when we look at the world, we see distinct entities. We feel that we can grasp things and, you know, grasp them and keep hold of them, uh, the things that we like and uh, we find pleasurable. And we also feel that we can get rid of things that we don't like, in other words, manipulate our, the world around us so that, the, so that we have more of what we like and less of what we don't like. So in other words, it seems like there are distinct entities um, and that we can get, that there are permanency in things uh, and that we can gain pleasure from them. And that's how we see things. We see things as distinct identifiable things that we can grasp and capable of giving us pleasure. However, the three signs of being, according to Buddhism, every phenomena, and when I say phenomena, I mean every physical object around us, every, uh, uh, everything mental, you know, mental processes, everything, everything possesses these three signs of being. Um, and uh, in Buddhism, you know, when we talk about various Buddhist laws uh, or teachings, actually there is no distinction between the physical world and the mental world. Um, the, the same laws uh, uh, apply, the same teachings apply to the physical world and the mental world. Uh, uh, and I'll, I'll explain a little bit more about that uh, in a minute. Uh, so the three signs of being are the three marks that everything possesses, every phenomena, physical and mental, possesses these three marks. And the marks uh, uh, that everything possesses is, is that of impermanency. Everything around us is impermanent. Uh, everything is coming to be and ceasing to be. Everything, all phenomena, has a mark of suffering. Uh, so, uh, in other words, every phenomena that we experience is actually a, a form of suffering, actually. In, in, in the, uh, uh, when, when, uh, when we are living in this mundane world, in our samsara. And the other, um, the third sign of being is that there is no self-identity to anything. You know, when we point at a table uh, and we say that this is a table, and just because we name it as a table and we, and we can use it as a table, um, you know, we think that there is a self-existing thing called table, but this teaching says that that is not so. So as I say, when I refer to things here, I include the physical and the mental phenomena. And actually, well, it actually refers to a perception of the physical world 
and also the mental world we inhabit. So um, when, uh, when I talk about these uh, um, physical uh, world having these marks, actually that physical world is actually processed through our brains, so to speak. Um, uh, and, and therefore uh, that what we actually see is also actually what we think is out there as objects is actually uh, our mental world as well. So, so, um, so it's, you know, both the physical and the mental world uh, possess, uh, possess these, uh, 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 these three marks of being. And so we, we see the world through our perception of it. Uh, and actually, uh, and this is really worth remembering uh, in Buddhism, it'll save us a lot of confusion. What Buddha is actually addressing is the world that is inside us. It's, uh, Buddha is actually not directly addressing the world out there. It's, the Buddha is not directly addressing the world of phys physical objects like science does. Buddha is actually addressing the world that is inside us. And the physical world, as I explained, is actually indirectly inside us too, through our perception. And that's actually what the Buddha is addressing. And th this is important because the world that we are actually living out of is not the world that is out there. It is a world of our own making. And that is actually the world we are living out of. And that is the world that um, is causing us problems and suffering. Um, and as I say, remember that this is what the teachings are addressing, that the teachings are actually addressing our, the world inside us will save a lot of confusion for us. So, you know, just to give an example of how we live out of the world of our own making, you know, we're all um, here on Zoom uh, listening to this talk. And uh, so we think, you know, we are all living in the same world. You know, we are listening to this, this same talk. We are hearing the same words. But, you know, some of us may be listening with interest and some of us may be bored. So they're in, and then those two worlds are completely different. Someone who's look, listening with interest is completely different from uh, their world is completely different from someone who's listening to this with boredom. So, so even though uh, apparently we're all hearing the same thing, we're actually living in a different world of our own creation. So Buddhist doctrine is saying that when we see phenomena, as graspable, it is a flawed view of the world. And it is in this very flow, so, sorry, it is this very flawed way of looking at the world, which leads us to not being in harmony with things as they are. So, uh, to give an example of this, you know, all this may sound very abstract. So let me give you a concrete example. Uh, say we have an antique table at home, which is a family heirloom. And, uh, you know, our grandparents have enjoyed possessing it. And, you know, it's been passed down the generations and now it is within our possession and we are enjoying this beautifully crafted and antique table at our home. And we fully expect to pass it down to our children to enjoy it uh, later on. So there is an air of permanency about this table. And when on a sunny day, the sun reflects on its beautifully polished surface. We're uplifted by it, and it seems to give us pleasure in owning it. And, you know, we call it a table, 
and it seems to have a definite existence as such. So therefore, you know, we are seeing the world as permanent, um, uh, as something that can give us pleasure and something that seems to have distinct entities like, you know, a table and, uh, and other things around us. But we know, say from science we know, that the table is actually ultimately made from molecules, atoms, etc., and the particles are in constant motion and changing from moment to moment. So on a hot day, we know from science that the table is a few millimeters longer than on a cold day. And so we say, so what? It's, it's still a table. However, this constant shift in underlying components can, st can suddenly stop the table from existing. So for example, the house can unexpectedly catch fire and the, and the table will be reduced to ashes. So, so where is that table now? The table that we have enjoyed uh, for last hundred years and the table that we expected to pass down to future generations, where is it now? So, you know, this very capacity of things to suddenly stop existing applies to everything. All is impermanent. And this is the first sign of being. And one thing that is very important to realize, and again, this, if you realize this early on, it'll uh, stop a lot of confusion, which is that this, in, we're calling the table impermanent, not simply because it existed for hundred years and then stopped existing and turned to ashes. That's not the only reason why we are calling this table impermanent. We are calling this table impermanent because it can stop existing from moment to moment. You know, one day we had this table, we thought it's permanent, we thought we'll pass it down to future generations, and suddenly it caught fire and it suddenly stopped, stopped existing. Every, every phenomena has this mark that it is impermanent from moment to moment. Another example, you know, we uh, make plans. We make plans for what we're doing tomorrow, what we're doing in a month's time, who we are going to see. And we go out and God forbid, we are caught in a ter terrorist accident and we're blown apart. We did not expect that, but that's the na nature of reality. Things, including us, including people we love around us, can stop existing any moment. So things, um, things are impermanent from moment to moment. At the same time as there is that table, going along with it is its quality of it being a no table at the same time. The two go side by side. The, we, we with our intellectual side can only see one part of the picture. And this is why uh, um, our normal way of seeing things gets us into trouble. We cannot see that things can both exist and not exist at the same time. So everything is actually straddling between existence and non-existence. We cannot say that something exists. We cannot say that it does not exist because there is something called table that we're using. So just to say that it doesn't exist is not quite right either. So everything is straddling the uh, straddling between existence and non-existence from moment to moment. And that's the nature of impermanency. Things are impermanent from moment to moment. So 
just because things are impermanent from moment to moment, we cannot grasp at those things. So we, we uh, things that we would like to get hold of, they pass away from our grasp. And this, this is why all things have this mark of suffering because they have this nature of not being able to grasp at it. It's like, it's like trying to grasp a fistful of water. As soon as we try and grasp the water, it just goes away from our fist. And that's, that's the nature of, of this. And therefore, all phenomena possess this mark of suffering. Now, care is needed here. Just because we are saying that things have this mark of suffering is not to say that we cannot, that, that there is something wrong with admiring the beautiful wood and the sun reflecting on the beautifully polished surface and us feeling joyful in, on looking at it. There is nothing actually wrong with that. You know, we can enjoy the table. Um, you know, uh, the, the, the problem for us arises when we want to make our existence such that if the table did not exist, then we are miserable. Then we do have a problem because everything is impermanent. Thus, all things are suffering, but, but we can enjoy them while, while they are there in front of us, and we can get joy out of them as well. And in this way, everything that we handle can be precious. They become like jewels in our hand, and we can really appreciate them for what they are and then let go for it when it's time for them to depart. They are like valued guests. And just as an aside, you know, while we went through the lockdown and, you know, some of us, uh, uh, I noticed, uh, you know, one of the participants is from Wales. Uh, so they are uh, going through a lockdown again. So while we're going through the lockdown, you know, some people may feel, you know, especially if some people are living alone and they have no one to see, you know, they may feel anxious, uh, et cetera. Um, but, you know, one thing we can do is, you know, we can really take care with things we handle. As, as I said, you know, we can treat them like valued guests. And, and, and by, by taking care of them, a, a relationship opens up with, with these objects. And uh, it's like, we are uh, actually participating in a real world and the anxiety can actually fall away. So, so you know, we can actually get joy out of uh, handling things. And, and uh, uh, that example of, of the lockdown shows that, you know, we sh we, we sh if, if we can take care in handling things, uh, give our full attention you know, to, to things that we are handling, then it can open out this different reality. And the third sign of being is that of no I. In other words, no, nothing has an identity of its own. It does not have a self-identity. So just like the table can stop existing at any moment, it has the characteristic of being a no table at the same time as it is a table. So it's not like, if, if we think the table has an identity as a table, full stop, then we are misleading ourselves. There is no self-identity to anything. They're all supported by causes and conditions. And when those causes and conditions change, then that thing doesn't exist anymore. So it only exists because of causes and conditions around it. It's not self-existing. Uh, 
And when we really examine nature of things, and we can do so in meditation, we see that there is no self to anything. And as I said, that this applies to physical things and to mental phenomena. But to start with, the, these three signs of being are easier to see with physical uh, objects and, and the physical world to start with. But as we go uh, further into the practice, we can see that the same teachings apply to our mental world. And although these three signs of being apply to all phenomena, a special analysis is made of uh, human beings. The Buddha analyzed beings, that is you and me, into five groups of ever-changing psychophysical forces or energies called five aggregates or five skandhas. And what we call a being is nothing but an ever-changing combination of these five aggregates. Lavinia, if we can have the next slide, please. Good, okay. So, so as I say, uh, you know, the, the, the three signs of being, uh, uh, apply to us uh, and uh, uh, and uh, and we have been analyzed we can analyze ourselves into these five uh, scandals which are on 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 the screen and I'll, I'll go through uh, through them uh, uh, but these although I'm uh, although I'm analyzing them into five scandals they are still uh, they still have the three signs of being. It's not like one is replacing the other. So in other words, although we're analyzing ourselves into these five skandhas, the five skandhas themselves uh, have, uh, uh, are impermanent, have a mark of suffering and are without self-identity. So uh, human beings, us beings can be analyzed into these five aggregates, which are uh, on the screen. The, the first one is a physical body uh, uh, called Rupa. And the next four are mental aggregates. So the first, uh, the, the, the second one is Vedana, which is feeling. Uh, uh, the third one is perception called Samajna. The fourth one is volitional impulses or samskaras. And the fifth one is consciousness or vijnana. The first one is the physical body that we are actually made up of. And this one is actually fairly easy to see that, you know, we are an um, aggregate of matter, what we're physically made of. And, and that, that's fairly self explanatory. The second aggregate is that of feeling or sensation. So, you know, these five skandhas are what we are. This is what's, the, this is what's happening to us like at every moment. Uh, and, I'll, and I'll explain that a little bit more. So the second aggregate that we're made up of is that of feeling or sensation. This is the feeling that immediately arises on contact with a sense object. It is the immediate feeling of pleasant, unpleasant or neutral that arises on a sense impact. And, and when I use this term feeling, a little bit of care is needed. When I talk of feeling, I'm not talking of feelings as in sense of emotion feeling as in terms of finding something pleasant, finding something unpleasant or finding something neutral. I'm not talking about emotions as such. I'm just, I'm just saying that as soon as a sense impact hits us, we find uh, that 
there arises in us a feeling of either pleasant, unpleasant, or neutral. This is the first bare immediate impact on seeing something or on hearing something or smelling something or tasting something or, teach, or, or, or touching something or thinking of something. And, and actually, and this has been shown by neuroscience to be true now, is that this actually arises even before we are aware of what we are seeing. In other words, even before we have become aware that we are seeing, uh, say, a table and, and named it as a table and seen it as a table, this is the, this is the first bare impression that arises even before uh, even before we've recognized the object uh, and known uh, uh, consciously that we are seeing that particular object. Uh, so it's, it's the very first thing that arises uh, uh, on, uh, uh, with our sense impressions. And actually, this is actually very important because this is the very thing that, is, uh, that preserves us because uh, this is the very thing that uh, we go towards or run away from. So if, if we are in uh, mortal danger, you know, we, we flee. Uh, and, and we do that even before we know what has happened. You know, like for example, you know, when we touch something that's hot and our hand straight away goes uh, away from it, um, that, that's an example of, of that feeling acting to, pro to protect us. And this, is a, this, and this happens even before we realize that we've touched something hot. So that, that's, uh, that's, that's what that Skanda is referring to. And, and, and uh, it's, uh, this is a very important one because this is the very Skanda when it comes in contact with all the other mental factors produces uh, our world of like and dislike. So this has a particular place uh, uh, in the scheme of things that we need to understand. Now, it is important to realize that not all beings experience the same feeling on seeing a particular object. You know, our brains are complex and different people react differently to the same stimuli, depending on what they've experienced before, particularly in childhood. Uh, uh, so for example, you know, if, uh, uh, say you're a fan of Formula One racing and you, you're switching channels and you see a Formula One ra race being televised, you know, you, a pleasant feeling arises in you, whereas your partner sitting next to you who has no interest in uh, Formula One, seeing that channel probably has a neutral feeling arise in them. So the same stimuli can produce different feeling in different people. And this is how we live in different worlds. And also the same stimuli can produce a different feeling at different stages in our lives. So for example, uh, children sometimes don't like uh, taste of coffee if, because it is bitter. Yet, you know, as we grow older, if we see smell of fresh coffee being wafted, uh, sorry, we, if you see smell of fresh, uh, sorry, we smell fresh coffee being brewed, uh, um, it, there arises in us a pleasant feeling if we like coffee. So, so you know, when we're little, we may not have liked that sensation, when we grow older, that feeling has changed and produces a pleasant feeling. So, so the feelings can change uh, over time and in different people. So it's, it's not something fixed. Going on to the third skanda, that of perception. This is when we recognize something and we name something. 
according to its mark. So we see a table of brains that processed it and we see it as a table and we name it as a table. So that's, that's what, so that's this, this particular scanner when we, when we recognize objects. The fourth aggregate is that of mental formations or some scars. And this includes all the mental factors except for Vedana, Samajna, and Vijnana. And it includes, for example, ideas, judgments, memories, planning, what we would like to do, what we'd love, uh, what, what, uh, what, uh, what frightens us, uh, what we can't approach. Uh, so that's, that's within this volitional uh, impulses or samskaras. That's the fourth aggregate. And the fifth aggregate is that of consciousness. This is consciousness of the senses. So in Buddhism, there are actually six senses. There are the usual five of seeing, hearing, smelling, tasting, and touching. But Buddhism also introduces a sixth sense. And again, a care, care is needed because uh, sometimes when people talk of sixth sense, they mean something totally different. When, when sometimes people talk of sixth sense, they, you know, they talk of uh, extrasensory perception, etc. This is This is not what I'm referring to here at all. Um, this is just a very ordinary sense, a very ordinary conscious, uh, consciousness on par with the other senses. It's, uh, it's nothing special like, you know, as, uh, uh, extrasensory perception or, or anything like that. So just care is needed when I, when I use the term sixth consciousness. So, so that sixth consciousness, which exists in Buddhism, is that of consciousness of mental objects and of thoughts. So the first five have ear, eye, nose, tongue, and body through which they are sensed. The sixth sense is sensed through our minds, which is regarded as the sixth faculty on a par with eye, ear, nose, etc. And because people find uh, exactly what this sixth uh, consciousness is re referring to difficult to understand. Let me give you an example. Say, you know, uh, we're sitting here and for those of us in England, it is probably our dinner time. We might be feeling hungry and, uh, uh, you know, say if, if, we, if we stop listening to the talk and we actually go, to our kitchen and we have a pizza because we're feeling hungry, we have a pizza. You know, it produces various sensations where when we see the pizza in front of us, you know, like salivating, etc., because we are hungry. Okay, so that, that's the physical object being in front of us. But say while we are listening to the talk and we are hungry, and because we're listening to the talk, we can't actually go and have uh, the, the actual pizza, but that doesn't stop us thinking about the pizza. You know, we, we're probably thinking uh, about our hunger and a and, and, and picture of a pizza arises in, in our minds. And that picture of a pizza can produce exactly identical response to the actual pizza being in front of us. And uh, 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 and, and so that's, that's, that is what is meant by consciousness of the, uh, uh, of, of, uh, the sixth consciousness. It is being conscious of these uh, thought objects, so to speak. And this is very important actually, because a lot of our suffering, a lot of our problems are actually not caused by the things that are physically present out there but our, our suffering actually arises from the mental pictures we have of these things around us. 
and in Buddhism, the purpose of the practice and meditation is to understand what we are truly seeing and feeling and cognizing. The world as we see it is through these five aggregates. In fact, or it's more accurate to say that we are actually these five aggregates. And so the world is subtly different for each of us because the mental pictures we have is affected through our own mental ma makeup. And in Buddhism, it is this mental individual world that we are looking at, for example, in our practice and in our meditation. This is our world, and this is where our problems arise from. So Buddhism is not directly interested in what is out there. It is actually interested in how what is out there is distorted into flawed pictures and taken to be real. So the Buddha says, in this very body, a fathom long, with his consciousness and perception, I declare are the world, its arising, its cessation, and cessation here means liber uh, being liberated from it, its cessation, and the path that leads to the cessation of the world. So I'll re just repeat this. In this very body, a fathom long, with its consciousness and perception, I declare our the world. That's where our world of suffering is arising, actually. And so he said, that's, I declare our the world, it's arising, it's cessation. So the liberation also lies in understanding what is within this fathom long body of ours. So problems are not because we do not have a big car or a big house or being in a relationship or not being in a relationship. It is because of the pictures that we have very deeply embedded in us of what these pictures are and what they mean to us. And they are actually falsely perceived and they are delusions. So this seeing that we are falsely perceiving things can occur when we actually begin to see ourselves as the five aggregates, then we can actually see the arising of physical and mental world from moment to moment. So the world that we see is actually a process uh, that occurs because of the past makeup that affects our current scene. So it, it's, 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 it's in a process and that's how our uh, world arises. It's, it's arising of the mental world from a process and it's a passing process. It's an ever-changing process. It's in a flux. And seen as a process, we can see that it comes into being and it passes away. And then there is a possibility of letting go of it. Instead of seeing it as things that are out there, we see it as a process. And then there is a possibility of letting go of it. So the three signs of being that that of impermanence, that of suffering, and that of no, no I actually applies to us as well. Or to put it another way, it applies to these five skandhas as well. And through our practice and through our meditation, we understand that the five aggregates themselves are impermanent, unsatisfactory, and without self. And I'll just read out something from one of the texts that I recommended, which is Pia Dersi's The Spectrum of Buddhism. He says, it is very hard indeed for people who are accustomed to continually think of their own 
mind and body and the external world with mental projections of whole, that is of self-existing entities, to then get rid of that false appearance of wholeness. So long as man fails to see as movements, he will never understand the teaching of no self, the doctrine of Buddha. So instead of seeing things as self-existing entities, we have to see things as, uh, as being in a process of coming to be and ceasing to be. Okay, so that's the first two topics for today. We'll now go to the third topic, the three fires. And you know, we've had quite a lot of material. And just to give us a breather, we'll just have a moment of calm before we go into the third fire or into the three fires and just give us an opportunity to come back to ourselves and refocus. Okay, so now let us look at the third uh, topic for the day, which is that of the three fires. Uh, in Buddhism, the doctrine says that we are driven by three fires. The first fire is that of wanting something that is desire. The second fire is its opposite, which is wanting to get rid of something that we do not like, which is anger or hatred or ill will. Uh, so that's the, uh, that's the second fire. And the third fire uh, is that of delusion or flawed seeing, also called avidya in uh, Sanskrit. Uh, so these are the three fires. And the teaching says that it, it, uh, it is these three fires that keep us revolving in this world of suffering, in this samsara. We keep on revolving from one state to another. From, sometimes we may be happy, sometimes we are unhappy, sometimes we are in health states, uh, sometimes we are truly human, kind, compassionate, etc. So, you know, we go from one state to another constantly hundreds of times a day. And what's driving us into all these unsatisfactory states are these three fires. And they, and just like a car is propelled by fuel, uh, so are we propelled by these fires. They are, they've got energy that keep us revolving. Uh, and, 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 and the reason why they're called fires is they actually burn inside us. We can, well, once we start practicing Buddhism, we can actually feel that these fires are actually burning inside us. And that's why they're, they're called fires. Sometimes they're referred to as the three poisons as well. And uh, the second fire, which is wanting to get rid of something that we find agreeable, sorry, that we find disagreeable, so, you know, things like anger or hatred or jealousy or ill will is actually a special form of the first fire. They said, you know, when we are feeling anger or ill will or hatred, that fire actually wants to get rid of the state or the thing that we don't like. And that itself is actually a desire. It is to desire uh, a, a state that agrees with us and to get rid of things that don't, don't agree with us. So, so the second fire is actually a special form of the first fire. So we can actually talk of both these two fires, the first and the second, uh, uh, as one, as desire. And when we talk of, of it as one fire, we are referring to both 
desire in the conventional sense, and we're also referring to anger, ill will, hatred, jealousy, things like that. And Buddhist practice, and particularly meditation, is an opportunity to look at a rising of these fires. Usually, when we want something, we just go out, manipulate circumstances to achieve what we want, and either we get it and we are momentarily happy, or we don't get it and we are unhappy. So usually, we are just aware of the end state of something making us happy or something making us unhappy. We are actually, generally speaking, not aware of the arising of that desire. And the Buddhist practice is to actually bring these fires into consciousness so that we are aware of the arising of these fires. And we and 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 hopefully we become aware of these fires before we start acting on it. So in the stillness of meditation and during practice, the arising of desire is seen like ripples or disturbances in the stillness. So that creates the awareness of that energy. And just by being aware that that energy is there, it is possible to catch it before we act out of it. <clears throat> in other words, by being aware, we can actually contain that energy. And when I say we become aware of it in meditation, I'm not just talking about meditation on a cushion. As Buddhists, we go about our daily lives in a meditative state and our daily activity is meditation as well. And this is important because if we can only be aware of desire and, and being able to contain it during sitting meditation, and then in our daily lives, let rip, it would not be of much use. And I can tell you from personal experience, you know, when uh, I've been, you, you know, I've, I've been following Buddhism for a long time. And I can, I can tell you, you know, I've been to uh, a Buddhist uh, meditation uh, session at the Zen Center. And, you know, the medit meditation has going really well. I feel calm. And then I get into my car and I start driving and someone suddenly cuts up in front of us. And suddenly, out of nowhere, the hand comes out and starts hooting. Where did that come from? So. You know, it's no good just being aware of it uh, on the cushion. We have got to be aware of this energy arising in our daily lives as well. So we, we learn to work with these fires uh, in a special way. We become, uh, we, we become aware of the uh, fire arising and then we do not get we do not run away with it we contain it and care is needed here this does not mean to say that we suppress that arising you know it is it is you know it is very important to know that these fires are, are arising uh, simply by brushing away that energy under the carpet it's not going to go away. So taking anger as an example, you know, we, we feel, okay, we are now in a Buddhist path. We must never get angry. And so, you know, if an anger is about to arise, we say, no, I'm Buddhist. I can't get angry. We push it away. We do not want to see it. Uh, and, you know, it keeps on happening again and again and again. And eventually that energy it's just going to sit there. It's going to build a force of its own. And one day we are just going to burst out uncontrollably. So what we don't do is pretend that these fires are not arising. Whether they are uh, things like desire, ill will, hatred, 
we have to be aware of them, uh, of them arising. We do not brush them away. So on the one hand, we do not brush them away. We become aware that they are arising. But on the other hand, we do not get carried away by them. And then that fire is in us. It's burning in us. And then it is possible to actually start to understand where that fire is coming from, what it is, what its purpose is. And we can actually start making friends with that fire, actually. And, you know, these fires are actually life forces. You know, um, we, in, in, in conjunction with our delusion, deluded seeing, they turn into desire or anger or hatred. But through Buddhist practice, these very energies are transformed into our useful life forces. And, and just, to, uh, just a little bit on the third fire, that of delusion. This is the delusion of not knowing how things really are. In other words, that is not seeing the three signs of being in our day-to-day -day life. In other words, we do not see that everything is impermanent, everything has a mark of suffering, and that everything has a no self-identity of its own. And it is, it is not seeing that, that is the fire of delusion. And when the fire of delusion combines with the other fires, that is when problems arise. And that is where we start building this world of suffering that we, li that we live through. So uh, I think uh, that is enough for today. Uh, so uh, Lavinia, you can put us on the full screen now. So uh, people can have an opportunity to ask questions. You, if you want, you can do it through the chat function and Lavinia will read out the questions. And we found out that last week that that actually worked quite well. You're quite welcome to unmute yourself and ask the question, but because you are spread over many screens, I may not be able to see you uh, immediately. So, uh, you know, uh, however, you know, feel free to ask questions whichever way you want. Lavinia, if you read out the questions for me, if there are any. Hello. Hi, Lavinia. Just give me one second. So we have a question from Pauline here. Yeah. Um, so what is the best practice to begin with? Uh, it is uh, to give ourselves wholeheartedly into what we are doing from moment to moment. So if we are washing up, then we give ourselves wholeheartedly into the washing up. Uh, if we are ironing, we give ourselves into the ironing. And to start with, uh, this is easiest done with physical tasks, you know, like ironing and washing up or cooking or gardening or, cle or cleaning. Uh, uh, I mean, eventually one should be able to do it in whatever one is doing, you know, even if one is working at a desk, one should be able to do it. But to start with, physical tasks that we are doing, give ourselves wholeheartedly into what we are doing at the moment and, and see if a new relationship opens up. Uh, and, and, you know, this, this uh, giving ourselves wholeheartedly into what, the, what we're doing at, the mom, uh, 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 doing at the moment helps us to be in touch with what is happening from moment to moment. So I, uh, so I think that's the best practice to start off with. Thank you. We have another question here. Yeah. Well, first of all, we have some thanks and greetings from Peter and Jennifer. Um, and then we have a question from William. Yes. Is there a benefit to studying Sanskrit as one of the fundamental languages of Buddhist scripture? particularly chants? Okay. 
uh, it depends w w uh, what your uh, uh, aim in, in Buddhism is. If your aim in Buddhism is to uh, understand Buddha's teaching and to gain some sort of liberation, uh, uh, it said it, it takes life, lifetimes for to achieve uh, enlightenment, but uh, that is not to say that uh, even through a little practice, we you know we, we can start get, getting benefit uh, uh, benefit of it straight away. It may not be full enlightenment, but we can still get benefit. And you know our, our world of suffering becomes a little bit easier. So if if that is your aim, it is to make it a little bit easier for ourselves to understand why we suffer. Uh, uh, then I would say that you, you do not need to uh, 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 study Sanskrit. And in fact, uh, st studying something like Sanskrit, uh, when your aim is to actually uh, understand Buddha's teachings as, as real living te teaching, can actually be a digression uh, uh, and not that helpful. Um, so so I, I would say that there's no need to study Sanskrit. And we're very lucky now. We we have so many things available in English uh, that we can refer to. Uh, so uh, if your aim is the practice, then it, it's it's a it's um, uh, it's not necessary. If you have a scholarly interest, then yes, then maybe yes, uh, you might benefit from uh, from it. If you, if you intend to do research into original texts or something like that. Then you would need to. So, so the answer is it depends, but definitely you don't need to for the practice. Thank you, Rohit. So we have here another question from Susan. Yes. Um, what about the fire to gain knowledge of the Dhamma? Okay. Yes, that's a that's a quite an interesting one. Um, so yeah, we, 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 we do need motivation. And this is why I say these fires are actually, uh, ha have a useful component as, as well. You know, all these things are life forces and they're useful. So, so that, uh, that uh, uh, fire of wanting to learn Buddhism and, and it firing us up is uh, a useful fire to start with. But then, you know, as we get, further and further into the practice, we realize we don't even need that fire. You know, the, the, the practice just carries us along. Just, it just takes us for, uh, forward, you know. We, 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 we build such faith in Buddhism that we just keep putting one foot after the other and it carries us. So to start with, before we have understood how to work with the fires, you know, if, you, if you're fired by, by this fire of wanting to learn Buddhism, that's fine, but uh, eventually you'll understand what that fire is as well, and you'll be able to contain that fire as well. Thank you. So we have another question here from Andrew. The three fires seem to be natural human states that we are born with. Yeah. Why do we have possibly natural human states in order to escape suffering? Sorry, why do we have? Why do we have possibly natural human states in order to escape suffering? Okay, so I assume, uh, uh, and I, it was from Andrew, did you say? Uh, yeah, so Andrew, if, if I have misunderstood, then do, do speak up. But I understand what, what, what you're saying, uh, saying is that, you know, if these are natural forces, why do they cause us problems in as as being human beings? You know, why are we driven by our desires, and uh, um, uh, and why does it cause us so much problem if it is such a natural thing? Uh, uh, and I hope I've understood the, your question correctly. Uh, if not, do speak up. Uh, uh, so uh, yes, as I say, these are actually life forces. And when we, have, when we understand what true reality is, then these fires stop becoming fires and they become natural life forces that guide us. Uh, 
Uh, but while we are in this world of delusion, then that's where they misguide us. So uh, it is because we don't see the reality correctly, you know, we do not see the impermanent nature of things. And then when these natural forces come into contact with a way of seeing the world, that it causes us problems. And you're quite right in wondering why, 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 why do that? Why, why is this fire did, causing us so much trouble when it's supposed to be such a natural thing? And actually, as human beings, we are born with a great gift that other beings, our animal uh, brethren, for example, don't have, which is that of intellectual seeing. You know, we've got this intellectual faculty. Uh, and that intellectual faculty that we have is actually a double-edged sword. On the one hand, it is very useful. You know, we have vast advances in medical science. You know, today, at this very minute, I can speak to someone in Australia if I wanted to. You know, so such is the nature of the advancement that we've had. And that has only happened because we have these intellectual capacities. But as I say, it's a double-edged sword. The same thing actually can cause us trouble. And it causes us trouble because we do not see the world correctly. Uh, and why we don't see the world correctly, uh, uh, it's, it's a long explanation, perhaps I can go into that another day, but uh, suffice it to say we do not see the world correctly, and therefore those natural forces create us problems. And once we do start seeing the world correctly, then those, those forces start being what they are of help to us. Uh, and just, uh, just a word of caution again, that so that our intellectual faculties do have a use. It is not that they uh, are, that, you know, simply, it's, it's not simply that they're causing us problems and therefore we should not have anything to do with them. That's not at all the case. As I say, we have made a lot of advances with that. The thing is, it's a gift, it's a special tool that we have learned to know when to use. Uh, and then when it's used correctly, then it's fine. Uh, the problem is uh, we do not actually uh, use it in, uh, as, a, as a tool correctly. So for example, you know, if you were to go fishing, you, you would, we would go fishing with a fishing rod. We would not go fishing with a hammer. But we sometimes use our intellectual ability like the hammer, you know, we use it for everything. It's just a special tool for doing certain things. And when we go through the practice of Buddhism, we understand when we are using that special gift, the special tool correctly, and when we are not. I hope that answers the question. Thank you. Um... We have another question here from Guy. How does seeing the three signs of being overcome suffering? Okay, so uh, uh, when we see the three signs of being, we, we begin to see the impermanent nature of the world. <clears throat> so that's when we begin to see, <clears throat> excuse me, <clears throat> that is when we begin to see that uh, all around us is impermanent, uh, and because it's impermanent, we cannot grasp hold of, hold of things forever. Things that we have grasped will go away from our grasp. Uh, 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 and and it, it's, it's, so those, uh, it's, it's when we understand those three signs of being that we actually start understanding that that is the nature of reality, that we cannot grasp anything, uh, and our problems are actually arising from wanting to grasp things and wanting to manipulate the things around us to, to be agreeable to us. And, and, and understanding of, of how things are in reality helps us 
to see through that uh, deluded thing of ours. <clears throat> I hope that helps. Thank you. So we have some other questions here. Um, Duzika asks, please, can you tell more about containing anger and about how to transform the energy when it is arising? Maybe um, if you could give some example. Uh, thank yeah. you. Yeah. Yeah. So uh, anger is like uh, any other energy. And in fact, anger is fairly easy to work with because it's very easy <clears throat> if it's extreme anger to become aware of it fairly easily. And the way to become aware of it is exactly as I have said, uh, is we do not get carried away by it. So in other words, we do not, uh, as soon as, uh, first of all, we got to be aware that that energy is in us. Uh, and once we are aware, then uh, we do not burst out into the anger. We really have to bite our tongue and really to contain it. And that is actually a very uncomfortable feeling because you know, we want to lash out at that person because you know, um, uh, if you're angry with someone, you know, we say, you know, I was right to get angry. Why did such and such a person do this? And they, they should not have done that. And we justify, we try and justify it in, uh, in our minds in all sorts of ways. But then if we contain that fire and, you know, none of these, none of, none of these things sort of work in one go, you know, it, it's, it's a practice that takes time. It, it takes years actually. And, you know, the practice is reinforced day after day. But eventually, you know, if you learn to contain that anger uh, and let that energy, energy just be there, then uh, we can actually sometimes actually see that, you know, how we were seeing things initially was actually not correct. You know, when we were actually getting angry with that person, instead, another much wider view opens up. Usually, you know, we are constrained by our usual world that we live in, the world of our own making, and we only see it within that context. But through practice, we learn to let go of that, our seeing widens out, and, there, and then we begin to see that anger in a different light. And we could see that perhaps it had got nothing to do with that person. It perhaps had something to do with my reaction to it. And this is something we learn in Buddhism uh, that actually, actually never ever uh, are any of these fires to do with people out there or things out there. It's always to do with what's arising in us. And therefore, you know, we learn to see what's arising in us and we then learn to contain it. We learn to work with it. We learn to make friends with it. And that is how to work with anger. And then anger is, uh, uh, that energy of anger is transformed. And, you know, we may initially be successful uh, once and then come another incident, we are totally unsuccessful. Uh, and then we still work at it, uh, but we don't take, you know, all these failures and just give up. They, you know, we have accumulated or acquired this way of seeing the world over, classically over lifetimes. And, you know, so it, it's going to take time to, to transform these things, but they would, they do transform. And when they transform, transform, even anger is a useful energy, not as anger, but as an energy that can actually protect us. Dushika, does that answer your question? <laughs> okay, that's good. Good. <clears throat> Thank you. We have another question here. I have been learning Buddhism and meditating daily for quite a while. However, as a lay person, I struggle to reach a balance between non-desire and day-to-day -day life. How do we reach the middle path between the materialistic desires, which are sometimes necessities for survival, uh, so for example, money and non-desire? Yeah, 
Yes, uh, first of all, you're absolutely right, you know, uh, uh, to, to, to realize that, you know, some of these material things are, um, you know, necessary. It is when uh, unnecessary qualities are put on them uh, that they cause us problems. Uh, so, you know, sufficient amount of money to live, uh, you know, to have food on our table or to do uh, daily things is fine. Uh, but uh, when that gets blown into, you know, I must have sufficient money so that I stand up well with my neighbors and, you know, I must have a big car because he's got a big car. That's when, when, when it's going, uh, that's when, when it's going wrong. Uh, so, uh, and this is what the practice again shows us when, when it is in the right balance and when it, when it is in the wrong balance. As to your question of how to achieve that balance, um, you know, I would say that really, uh, if you're doing it on your own, uh, you, you know, uh, uh, by reading and, you know, trying out, it is extremely difficult to do. Uh, Buddhism is very, it's very difficult to, um, A, understand and B, uh, to, to, to learn to contain these energies. And sometimes we don't even know what, what, what these energies are. You know, we, 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 we think, you know, everything is plain sailing. We have no issues or no problems, but under, underneath, underneath all that might be a deep anxiety or a deep fear that we don't even know is there. So, you know, these things go deep and it's very, very difficult to practice on our own. We really need to find a good teacher uh, who, who, who's, through whose guidance we can actually practice, uh, it's, it's a necessity. Uh, and unfortunately, that's, it's a very difficult process. Uh, uh, and, and I'd clarify again what I said last time. When I say a teacher, uh, I mean, I, I don't mean, so, you know, I, I'm teaching this introducing Buddhism course. I don't mean teacher in that sense. I mean a teacher who really uh, has lived through all this and we can hold as an example, as a living example of, uh, and, and, and who, is, who can genuinely help us. There are teachers like that out there. So, you know, we have to find one. Uh, and if you, uh, you know, if you're affiliated with the society, then, you know, the society has various uh, practice uh, courses in various traditions like Tibetan, Thai, uh, uh, or, or Theravada, uh, Mahayana, uh, um, uh, Zen, uh, Pure Land, etc. So you, you can start, um, you know, practicing through what the society is offering uh, if you have difficulty finding teachers. And there, there are good ins institutions out there. You just have to find them and, you know, find those teachers. Okay, so I hope that answers that. Are there any other questions, Lavinia? Yes, there are quite a few questions. Uh -huh. um, there are two from Khan. The first is, could you please explain what is volitional impulse? Okay, volitional impulse is when something is intended. <clears throat> when an intention forms in ourselves of doing an action, um, and that action could not, uh, may not just simply be a physical action. It can be uh, something done through speech uh, and it could be done through our thoughts as well. So it could be a physical action, it could be done through speech or it could be done through mind. Uh, and um, so there is some sort of impulse there that is wanting us to do it. Some sort of uh, 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 something that's driving us uh, to do it. Uh, 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 so the uh, uh, wanting to do it uh, or, or willing that action, in other words, is a useful, uh, not a useful, but is a, um, is a necessary part of it being volitional. So for something to be volitional, it has to be willed. So, uh, you know, uh, um, feeling hungry and uh, uh, thinking about what you're going to eat is a volitional thinking action, touching that hot stub and pulling our hand away from it is not a volitional action. There was no thought involved in it. So when I say thought, I, I don't necessarily mean that uh, 
brain processes are not involved. Uh, uh, you know, that uh, nerves uh, uh, are not involved. So, you know, th those might be involved, but then, uh, so, so but, but the distinction, so when we pull away the hand from the hot stuff, you know, our brain functions are probably involved, uh, our nerves are involved, um, but that does not make it volitional. Volitional is when there is some sort of conceptualization. So, you know, that process, uh, uh, of being aware of something and thinking of something has gone further down the line and we have actually formed a will to do something. So, so wanting will is, is, a, is a necessary part of something being volitional. And there was a second question from the gentleman. Yes. So um, what do you mean by practice? Yes, um, so practice means, and we will actually be talking about the practice, so it, it's coming in the future lectures, is, you know, what Buddha laid out his teachings as four noble truths, and uh, uh, the fourth of the four noble truths is the part of, uh, is the path of practice. It is following that path of practice, uh, and, and it is basically following the path of practice that Buddha has laid out, which we'll be talking about, which is, uh, which is practicing Buddhism, actually, actually doing certain things in our daily lives rather than just thinking about it. That is practice. Thank you. Um, we have here a question from Carmela. Could you please say a bit more of the difference between repressing a fire and not being carried away by it. Yes. Uh, I kind of have some intuition of it, but uh, I'm struggling to clearly differentiate between the two. Yes, yes, very important. You know, you raise a very important point. It is very, uh, very important to be clear. Um, so uh, the answer lies in being aware we should be aware of every pro mental process that is happening within us as far as we can be. And uh, uh, given this uh, example, which I already given, but uh, I hope this, this might uh, uh, make it clearer. I've already given it, but uh, let me see if by giving it again, it, it makes it clearer. So, um, uh, so getting angry, uh, you know, that's a fire arising and, uh, 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 you know, we might say to ourselves, you know, we are Buddhists, we must never get angry and therefore we, uh, we have nothing to do with that energy of anger and therefore, you know, whenever an anger is about to arise, instead of bringing it into consciousness, we say to ourselves, no. No, I'm a Buddhist. No, no, no. You, you have no, no business arising. That is repressing that fire, and that is very harmful, uh, and it's not going to do any good for the practice. So, we do not do that. We, whenever a fire is arising, we acknowledge it, and uh, uh, but we don't care, get carried away by it. And you know. It's true that we know we, you know, there are so many fires arising in us that we are not aware of uh, all the fires arising. But the more we practice, the more we are aware that these fires are arising. Um, uh, another example, um, you know, I say, you know, um, you know, we may feel that there is everything is fine with our world. You know, generally there's no suffering. You know, we 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 lead a very pleasant life. But, and we may not be aware that, you know, lurking deep inside us is a form, some sort of fear, some sort of anxiety, um, and we're not actually willing to look at that. Uh, and it's, it's fine if, if, if you're not, uh, you know, in the beginning, we're not uh, aware of it and, 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 and you're not looking at it. But on the other hand, if we are aware that that is there and, and, and we are not willing to look at it, then it is repressing it, and that is not very helpful. 
and uh, uh, and uh, also a, a, a warning. Uh, you know, some of these uh, fires have a lot of energy, particularly fears, anxiety have a lot of energy in it. We may not actually know how to work with it with those fires. We we, we don't have to start working with those big fires. Uh, in fact, the practice is to start working with the small fires to start with, you know, to start working with a minor irritation, you know, when a bus does not arrive and we get irritated, you know, then we uh, are aware that there is that irritation. You know, we would start working with those minor irritations. Some of these fires are very, very um, difficult to work with to start with, and it's, we take one step at a time. 